So uh, the next session is uh, about uh, building a believable character, and uh, we welcome my friend Simon <laughs> from uh, Natural Motion with their groundbreaking game, um, Clumsy Ninja. I think you all know about the game, so no need to present. Uh, it's a pretty big game right now, so thank you. Thanks. Hi. So um, I'm the CTO of Natural Motion. Um, I've been with the company quite a long time now, and uh, Clumsy Ninja was uh, a really exciting project for me because um, it was actually the first time that we released a mobile game that really made use fully of the, the technology that we developed when kind of the company was just starting up. And what I want to, to talk about today is a little bit about the history of building that simulation technology and how we developed that and took it to build uh, the mobile experience that is Clumsy Ninja. And in particular, I want to focus on the issues around creating the, the really engaging character that, that we have in the, in the game and uh, look a little at kind of the, the tricks that we have there to, uh, to pull that off. Um, and then obviously look at the kind of results, the reactions to it. So let's take a, a huge slide back into history and start off with the, the very first prototype ninja, as it were. So this was the original uh, kind of simulation technology, the research work that started off uh, natural motion. So this was um, research work from the zoology department at uh, Oxford University. And it was looking at how to simulate um, a walking character. So this is a little kind of two-legged character, a biped character, and we're looking at running it inside a physics simulation, so it's physically simulated legs, um, using a neural network controller to try and make the, the character walk like a human. And the, uh, you know, the algorithms ran overnight, and this is the amazing results of, of that research. So the character's walking, and he's moving around, but doesn't exactly look perfect. So a little bit more work was required. And one of the, the key things, as well as improving the, the neural network controllers, was to build uh, an artificial evolution system. So the idea here is we've got a bunch of inputs to, uh, to the controllers, kind of randomize them, test out a whole load of, of different ones. The ones that do best, you select and use as the basis for trying out more randomizations later on. And this, this sums up um, what we got out of uh, that approach. So you can see here, we start with a character that can just kind of wave its legs around a bit, and it obviously falls over and wanders around. But after five generations of the artificial evolution process, what we end up with is a character that's able to take first couple of tentative steps before falling over, and then still kicking its legs and wandering around. But then. After 10 generations, you can see we're starting to get really quite definite steps. And the character moves forwards before ultimately failing and falling over. And then finally, after 20 generations, we get to the kind of boring bit of the video, which is um, a fully simulated character that's able to actually walk on its own. So all this work is a great kind of breakthrough in, in the, the research. But ultimately, we've ended up with a character that's able to walk and probably not quite as well as a, a piece of animation would, would have a character walk. So how did this lead to, to natural motion? Well, the idea is we can take this simulated character and we use this as a, way, a new way of creating animation. Because this is running in a simulation, it can adapt and react to dynamic changes in the environment um, and the, the physical simulations that occur within a game. Um, and in fact, the first uses we, we had for it um, weren't for games at all. Um, we took the, the technology, put it into an animation tool, and let animators basically have a kind of virtual stunt man. And what, the, uh, what this, this package let you do was build um, kind of stunt man effects for movies and, and uh, commercials and that sort of thing. But it started to gain traction building um, animations for, for games. And then around the kind of mid-2000s, we had the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3 were coming up, and we were able finally to take this, this technology, 
and adapt it for real-time use. And that was uh, the system that we call Euphoria. So what this lets us do is take that simulated character and now have it inside a, a game animation engine and have the character actually be able to respond dynamically to physical interactions uh, in the game. So this video um, was captured from someone actually playing a, a live build. So, so this was all captured live, moving the, the arrow around and so on. And you could see we're able to have our character respond uh, dynamically according to what the, the kind of interactions are. So we've got kind of shot reactions, and obviously they're different every time according to, to where the, the character's shot. You know, there's no animation in here at all. It's all simulated on the fly. That then blends into an animation for standing up. But the great thing about the technology is we can take the same, um, the same behaviors, the, the, the same controllers, um, and apply it to very different characters. And they perform the same basic actions, but their motion will be different because of their different kind of mass distribution and, and so on. And again, you can shoot this guy a fair bit. And you can see we're also able to balance. It's a slightly random kind of video, but you can see how actually different um, characters are able to balance more or less effectively, um, depending on, again, their kind of mass distribution, how many legs they've got, and so on. And we're also able to deal with kind of interactions with um, objects in the environment, so very kind of dynamic interactions like this, where you don't know where the box is going to come from, um, and you can still respond to it dynamically. You get lots and lots of different kind of reactions. So Euphoria was produced as a, a piece of middleware. It was something that we, we licensed out to, to game developers to, to use in their games. Um, and it's primarily been used by uh, Rockstar in GTA 4, GTA 5, Red Dead, Max Payne. And they're continuing to use it in, uh, in future titles as well. And what this allows them to do is to have very dynamic character reactions. So characters that react according to how the player uh, interacts with them, how they interact with the environment, how they interact with other characters. So these are uh, kind of typical uh, things from, from GTA, um, you know, shot reactions and so on, um, are all simulated so that you get different reactions according to how you hit a character, um, and what they fall into, and, and so on. And so it's used all over the place for little bits of, of kind of bridging animation between the, the main character animations. And that obviously gives you a lot of flexibility in, uh, in how you, you can tie different animations together and deal with different situations and so on. But using simulation also leads to other effects. Um, and a key one of those is the idea of emergent behavior. So the idea is that when you're using simulation for, for characters, you can get things happening that you've never kind of expected, things that you've never kind of pre-programmed. And this is actually something you normally want to avoid in traditional games. You know, things like GTA, you kind of want to know what's going to happen. You don't want to have to hand animate every reaction. That's why you use simulation. But you want to know roughly what's going to happen. But you can actually have really fun things happen when you, you have emergent behavior. So in this case, um, we just put two characters down who are just told to, to kind of protect themselves and keep things away from, from themselves. And we put them down next to each other, and they just started doing this. And we didn't program them to, to do this particularly, but you get this strange little kind of squabbling effect. And it is just kind of fun. And they kept doing it for ages. You know, it's <laughs> we, we, we did quite a short capture on the video, but they, they just carry on doing this for like 20 minutes or something, kind of pushing each other away. And so we just thought maybe it'd be fun to try and build something that actually lets people experience this kind of emergent behavior um, and trying to, to get a feel for what you can do with simulation when you don't quite know what's going to happen. And do that in a, a kind of environment where it doesn't matter. It's not gonna, to, going to detract from the game. So also around this time when we're thinking about doing this, um, we're up to the kind of iPhone 4, iPad 2 type era. And what we found was 
actually the performance on mobile started making it quite possible to, to run Euphoria. So this is running obviously a full physics simulation and, um, and the, the behaviors on top of that. So that looked quite, quite exciting. And then on top of that, of course, there's the idea of having a touch screen. So when you're working with Euphoria, what you really want is to have that direct physical interaction with the characters. You know, it's all about seeing the response to, to kind of physical interactions. And when you're using kind of console controls in particular, but also when you're using like mouse and keyboard and stuff, you can feel quite detached from how you're interacting with characters. You know, touch just seemed really good for that. And we'd, we'd had a bit of success by this time on, on the mobile gaming side, and we just thought, you know, let's try and make a, a Euphoria game for, um, for iOS. So what we did was established a, a pretty small team, sometimes just one or two people and sometimes a few more, on uh, a project that we called uh, Euphoria Toy initially. Um, and the idea was to basically build an environment where you'd have a character and you get all the kind of physical reactions that, that you expect from Euphoria, a basic locomotion system so you can walk the character around, and then you could build objects for the character to play with. Um, and you would experiment by you know, building different environments and, and again, getting that kind of uh, emergent behavior and seeing what kind of uh, gameplay you could, you could kind of build yourself. So this is that Euphoria toy. Um, I don't think we've ever actually showed this before. So <laughs> this is a capture off an iPad. Um, and you can see we've got this, this basic character. You can make him walk around, so you just kind of tap where you want the, the character to walk to. And uh, he goes there. But then you've also got physical interaction. So you can hit him, you can tap him to, to apply forces, knock him over, and then we use some basic kind of get up animations. And then again, you can drag him around, throw him around, um, and just kind of see how he, he responds. Um, and then you could build a whole bunch of different kind of objects in the environment. So we can build boxes, move them around, see how he interacts with them. Um, interact with him using a box, um, and so on. Um, and then we let you kind of build up structures and stuff as well. So you could build, say, uh, a whole stack of, of these, these boxes, one on top of another, and then see how he interacts with, uh, with that stack of, of boxes. So he falls over them, or he can grab onto to the edge of the, the boxes and stuff. So you had this very kind of physical environment where you could, you could have a, a bit of a sandbox. You could, you could build up all these different things and just see how the, the guy's gonna, gonna react. And you know, we managed to make it look pretty, pretty sweet as well. And it, you know, it was running smoothly and, and felt pretty good. So what was the reaction to that? Well, it was a great tech demo, basically. Um, you know, I think it really helped to, to show off the technology. You know, I would love to go around showing it when I was trying to sell the, the middleware to people. Um, but beyond that, we got a kind of sense of genuine amazement at what was actually possible on, uh, on a mobile platform. You know, this, this wasn't something people thought you could do on mobile, and it really amazed them. And we were, re you know, we were really excited about that. And it was great fun to see what the character could do in that kind of physical environment. How does he interact with all these, these different things? So in a way, it was very positive. But there was also a big problem, which is it wasn't that engaging. It was kind of thing, it was fun to play with for a bit, for a fairly short time, you put it down and you forget about it. Now, when we were looking at this, it was around about the time when you got a big shift in the, the app store and in the purchasing habits away from paid games to free to play. And we were changing all our kind of business approach to, to move to, to free to play. And in that kind of business, you can't have this really kind of short lived engagement. You can't just take your 99 cents and go. You need to, to keep people playing the game. And this game didn't have that. So it didn't make any kind of commercial sense. So we, we started thinking about, well, why doesn't it engage people? Why don't people want to keep playing with it? And the single biggest issue, really, is this guy. And he doesn't have any charm. He doesn't have any real personality. So people don't care about him. And the kind of fun from the game 
is purely from the kind of physical interaction. It's throwing him around, it's hitting him, it's kind of hurting him a bit, but you don't really care about that. It's just looking at what the tech does. And so what we needed to do was to, to think of how to build a truly engaging character that people actually want to spend time with. So it's not all about the, the, the interaction, it's about just being with that character. So we obviously spent a lot of time um, trying to develop different characters and, and run through a lot of concepts. And obviously, as you know, we settled on, on Clumsy Ninja. Um, and he went through a, a good few kind of iterations. Um, the, the clumsy bit um, came purely from uh, the kind of the early uh, Euphoria. Um, Euphoria toy was variously called Clumsy Toy because you know, quite often the behaviors weren't so good. Um, that's kind of improved over time. The ninja bit just came from everyone liking ninjas, really. There's, there's no better reason than that. Um, so we obviously had to develop the character. And there are a few pretty important things to, to think about when you're, you're building a character like that. We needed the guy to be kind of lovable in a, in a sense and kind of charming, but he also had to be instantly recognizable. It was really important that this character was going to be easy to, easy to spot. Um, so you'll notice his little kind of pointy ears, which in many ways don't make a lot of sense, but they provide um, a very recognizable silhouette. So that was a, a kind of key bit of design. The other thing you'll notice is he basically doesn't have a mouth. It's, it's always covered. And this saved us basically a whole load of trouble. You don't have to animate it, you don't have to render it, um, and you don't have to deal with language, because we didn't want to get into that in this kind of game. We didn't want to have issues of how, how's the ninja going to talk and so on. So get rid of his mouth. You don't need to worry about it. Um, and then obviously we made sure we could, we could have a character that we could dress up in different ways. So obviously that covers the, the basic character. Around that obviously there's lots of work separately that went on to building an environment, working out um, some kind of story for the game. But yeah, that's not what I'm looking at today. Um, so we kind of got to the point where we had um, the character model and all the environments around it. And we started to actually have a, a kind of coherent and, and fun game. And the, the basic kind of the animation and the euphoria stuff all work really well. So you've got a good kind of physicality to the character and you can move him around. Um, and he, he kind of interacted with everything as, as you'd expect. But actually, beyond the basic animation, we needed a few more extras to really make players believe in that kind of little living character inside their phone, which is, is what we were, were going for. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of those. One of the huge things was the eyes of, of the character. Um, we covered the mouth, as I explained. So actually, all of kind of expression of the character is through the body language and through the eyes. And getting the eyes right was absolutely critical. You can see we ran through a whole bunch of different concepts um, and lots of kind of tests for, for how the, the eyes could work. Um, it really was a big bit of, of work. And beyond just getting the, the basics of the kind of shape and the look of it, the eye movement was really, really important. So you could obviously, if you don't have any eye movement at all, then it just looks plain bad. But if you get the eye movement not quite right, this is one of those, those times when you get straight into the uncanny valley. You've got this kind of really creepy effect where it just doesn't feel right. So the other aspect, of course, is because we're using simulation to move the character and you need the, the eyes to, to respond, all of that also had to be procedural. So all the solutions we came up with had to be coded to deal with how the pupils should move around, when he should blink, and how he should kind of look at the, the screen. So I'm just going to run a, a little video which um, shows just some typical things happening in, in Clumsy Ninja. And what I would suggest is rather than just looking at the game as a whole and looking at the, you know, looking at the character as a whole, just watch his eyes. Watch what he does. Because there's actually a surprising amount going on here. So he'll obviously look at an object as, as you move it around, and he'll change his focus. But then when nothing's really going on, he stops looking at it. He doesn't just stare crazily. You'll also notice he blinks at a fairly believable rate. And for smaller movements, he'll track with his eyes before using his, his head. 
as he kicks an object, he'll look down and see what it is that, that moved. When it goes out of sight, he doesn't just blindly keep staring at it, will we'll realign and, and so on. And in this example, you'll see with smaller objects near him, again, his pupils there will lead. He doesn't move his head when he doesn't need to. He'll blink. He'll keep watching while something's moving around him. And once he doesn't need to look at it, he'll look back at the, at the player, at the, the camera. And by getting that right, you can start to get quite a, a lot of emotion out of the character. You know, in what's going on here, his, you know, his body movement is pretty crude. But just from the way that he kind of stared at you at the, at the end there, you get a kind of sense for, for what's going on. So the game's very much about the player directly interacting with the ninja, having these kind of very physical interactions. But that experience actually is much more engaging if somehow that interaction is, is reciprocated. Um, and so you saw the ninja looks at the camera. He looks at the player. He's kind of questioning you in a way. You, at least you can read into it, that kind of thing. And that's one of the reasons why we built in the, the high five mechanic. Um, and in that way, we actually have the ninja directly request interaction from the player. And this is something that it turns out players really love, and it's been hugely successful. So for those of you that haven't seen it, um, you finish a task and you get your, your XP and the, the ninja comes towards you and he asks for a high five. And he wants you to touch him and if you do it, you follow the routine, everything's great. Now, you can of course ignore him. So if you, uh, if you ignore him, he tries quite a long time. I actually cut out about 10 seconds in the middle of this video because I didn't have enough to say. But <laughs> he'll, he'll, um, he'll ask for the high five. You ignore him for the first time. And he'll keep going. And he'll keep asking. And you actually find it's quite hard to ignore him. If you hold this in your hands and you ignore him for long enough, it's quite hard. <laughs> and once, you, once you've got that reaction, once you're not going to ignore him again. So anyway, those are a few tips and tricks. This is obviously how things ended up. So uh, this is our, our launch trailer. And throughout this, I, I would urge you to look at the guys, look at how the character interacts with, with the player as, as well as what's going on um, in the, the kind of virtual environment. So, how did it go? Um, pretty well. Um, Apple loved it. We got um, a, a feature at launch, including a, a unique page on the App Store that included a, a video, um, which is a, a whole new thing. Um, and we got 10 million installs in, in the first week. So, pretty successful um, from, from kind of commercial point of view. But crucially for us, um, the player reaction was amazing. So all over social media, we got loads of really positive comments. Players, players really love playing Ninja. But the really cool thing, for me at least, was this, was people engaged with the character. It wasn't just playing the game, it was about the Ninja. And this is just an example of some of the fan art that was either online or got sent directly to us, and people dressing up as the Ninja and all that kind of stuff. There's, there was loads of it. And I think this, this says we, we really nailed it. We wouldn't have got that with our Euphoria toy guy. So a few of the, the kind of key lessons from this is the character simulation on, on mobile really does let you have unique experiences. It really does kind of amaze people at what's, what's possible. 
but fairly obviously, really, the, the cool tech is not enough. You need a whole game around it, but you also need, for this kind of thing, a really engaging character. And as I've shown you, there's a, a few tricks to getting that right. And if you do get it right, what you can do is combine that kind of cutting edge tech with the kind of cool art and stuff and end up with a, a, an experience that kind of really wows the, the players and gets you that kind of reaction. So that's it, I'm pretty much out of time. Um, so thank you all for listening. Um, if you do want to ask any questions, we may have a couple of minutes, otherwise you'll find me, no. um, you'll find me outside um, later. Um, otherwise hit up naturalmotion.com if you want to know more. Um, and a quick plug, it's a great place to work and we are hiring. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we won't have time for Q&A, but if you want to chat with Simon, I invite you to talk with him outside the room if you want, or catch up by email or exchange through Skype. Thank you. <laughs>